Hello everybody and welcome to our second video now in module 12-4. Here we're going to be doing another test of goodness of fit on a normal distribution. Now, in the first video for 12-4a, I went through a fairly long discussion on the underlying methodology. I'm going to try to keep this video a little bit shorter and we'll kind of stick to the point. Uh, of, of going through step by step how to do this type of problem. Okay, so a local painting company that employs students is doing some analysis on completion times, uh, completion times of its employees. One of one part of the analysis is to determine if the completion times are normally distributed or not. The data below consists of the number of minutes it took each of 30 employees to finish painting a small bedroom. I'm circling 30 because that's going to be a useful number. The average completion time was 74 minutes with a standard deviation of 15. The data has been sorted from largest to smallest for convenience. So here is that data set. And once again, it looks more like it's been sorted from smallest to largest, but it makes no difference how you sort the data. As long as it's sorted, it does make things somewhat easier. So first step, as always, we formulate our test. So our null hypotheses, the population is normally distributed, is normally, I'm going to abbreviate distributed with a mean of 74 and a standard deviation of 15. The alternative hypotheses, as you might expect, the population is not normally distributed with mean 74 and standard deviation 15. Okay, so there's our null and alternative hypotheses. Now, first thing we need to do, of course, compute the actual or the observed and the expected frequencies. So what we need to do here is, because we're working with a continuous distribution, we need to set up intervals. How do we set up these intervals? Well, again, we need those expected frequencies to be at least five, and that is just a requirement for this chi-squared test to work. So I want my intervals to contain, uh, to I can expect them to contain five observations if the null is true. So if I take my 30 observations, divide that by five, well then that gives me a nice clean six intervals. I'm gonna produce six intervals with an expected frequency of five in each one of them. And then that of course adds to 30. Now, I want these to be equal probability intervals. So I'm gonna say, well, each of those intervals in my standard normal distribution could, should correspond with a probability of 0 0.1667. So what does that mean? If we look at that standard normal distribution, here with that mean of zero, here I'm gonna produce six intervals. And in that standard normal distribution, this corresponds to a probability of 0.1667. This one corresponds to a probability of 1667, and this one also corresponds to a probability of 1.667, and it's a symmetric distribution, so it's exactly the same on the upper half of that distribution. So the first thing that we need to do, find the corresponding Z values. I have one extra interval here. There we go. Find those corresponding Z values. So I'm going to go to my Z tables and I look for that Z score that corresponds with a lower tail probability of 0.1667. So we come down here and I'm looking for 1667 
That's probably the closest I'll get right there. Negative 0.97. Okay, so that gives me my negative 0.97 here. The next one, I want that one, so where this corresponded to 1667, the next one is going to correspond with twice that, 0.1667 times 2, 0.3334. So I go back to my Z tables, and I want to find that Z score that corresponds with the probability of 0.3334. Here's the closest I'll find. Negative 4, negative 0.43. Negative 0.43. Next one is 0. That corresponds to an area. Of course, this whole area here is equal to 0.5. Now then, because this distribution is perfectly symmetric, I know this next one is going to be positive 0.43 and positive 0.97. And that's going to give me, again, all of those same probabilities in each of those intervals. Now I'm going to transfer that to my assumed distribution. That distribution that is assumed to be the case in a world in which the null hypothesis is true, and we have a distribution with a mean of 74 and a standard deviation of 15. So I'm going to drop these values down and find the corresponding values in that normal distribution. So this first one, I'll, I won't write this calculation out for all of them, but here this one is going to be 74 minus 0.97 times that standard deviation is 15, 74 minus 0.97 times 15. So that gives me that lower value of 59.45. So this next one is going to be 74 minus 0.43 times 15. 74 minus 0.43 times 15. That gives me 67.55. The next value is 74. Up here, 74 plus 0.43. And this one, 74 plus 0.97. I said I wasn't going to write all those out. There we go. I did it anyways. Oops, 74 plus 0.43 times 15. This one is 80.45. 74 plus 0.97 times 15, 88.55. And there, finally, are our intervals. Now, based on how we have defined these intervals, by setting these intervals up so that my expected frequency with six intervals my expected frequency in each of these intervals, if the null hypothesis is true, I would expect five observations to fall into each of these intervals. And of course, that gives us our 30 observations. So now we have our expected frequencies. The next step is to use those intervals to now count our actual frequency or our observed frequency. So I'll go through the same type of calculation that we did here before. We'll go through and we'll count our observed frequency. Here we already have our expected frequency because of course this is 
how we defined our intervals, one, two, three, four, five, six intervals. And then, of course, we'll calculate those differences. Then we'll square those differences. Then we'll divide those differences by the expected value, which in this case is always five. And then we'll add those up. And here's our chi-squared test statistic. So let's go back to our sample. I'm looking first, I want to count observations smaller than 59.45. So I come back up here, I have one, two, three, four, I have five observations in that first interval. So I have five observations here. Now in our next interval, we're going to be counting observations up to 67.55. So I'm gonna come back up here, and I'm gonna count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten observations in that next interval. So I'm gonna come back here, I have my observed frequency, I had 10 observations in the next interval. Now I'm gonna count those up to 74. So if I come up here, now I'm going to count one, two, three observations in that interval. Now I'm going to count up to 80.45. One, two, three, four observations. Now I'm going to count up to 88.55, one, two observations. And finally, I'm gonna count those greater than 88.5 for that last interval. And here I have one, two, three, four, five, and six. So here I have six observations. Now the rest is very much the same as the other upper, upper tail chi-square test that we've done. I'm gonna calculate those differences. I'm gonna square them, divide by the expected value, which here is always five, and get our test statistic and go from there. So this first one, five minus five, zero, squared is zero, divided by five is zero. The next one is five, 25, divided by five is five. Three minus five, this is going to be uh, two, well, minus two, but it doesn't really matter, we square it anyways, and that's gonna give us 0.8. Here I have minus one, that's gonna give us one and 0.2 minus three, nine, nine over five, 1.8, one, one, and 0.2. Okay, now I'm gonna add those up. 0 0.2, 1.8, 0 0.2, 0.8, and five, and zero. That gives me a test statistic exactly eight. What do we do with it? Same as always. I need to go to my chi-squared tables. I need to know which chi-squared distribution is relevant to this problem. And so our degrees of freedom, k minus p minus one, k is the number of categories, which in this type of test means the number of intervals that we're using. We have determined five intervals six intervals. We have six intervals. P is the number of parameters that we've estimated. Here we have estimated two parameters, 74 the mean and 15 the standard deviation. So I have six, I have two, six minus two is four, minus one, 
I have three degrees of freedom. Our test statistic is eight. Our significance level, our significance level is not given. Let's just use a 05 level of significance. Let's go to our chi-square tables. Scrolling down past our Zs. And here I have three degrees of freedom. My test statistic is between these two values. And of course, there's my level of significance. So here I have a chi-square distribution, something like this. I have a critical value of 7.8 as always that defines our rejection space and our do not reject that gives me an area in that upper tail of 0.05 our test statistic is 8 right in here according to that critical value approach it is in the rejection space according to that p-value approach well certainly I can see it's less than 0.05 it's going to be here between 0.05 and 0.025. So our test statistic gives rise to a p-value less than 0.05, greater than 0.025, with a 5% level of significance. We have sufficient evidence here to reject. We have evidence to support the alternative hypotheses. This distribution is not normally distributed with a mean of 74 and a standard deviation of 15. Okay, so that was a quick version of doing this type of test, and it still took uh, 15 minutes to do, almost 20 minutes to do. These aren't quick exercises, but Hopefully, with a little bit of practice, you'll figure out a routine, you'll get into a habit, and you'll find an easy way to push through these calculations each time. Okay, thanks for watching, everybody. I hope that this was helpful. Bye-bye.